I, I want to talk about um, the theory of law and present on the one hand what we might call the Austrian theory of law, but it is probably yeah, uh, exaggerated to say this is the Austrian theory of law. That is the theory of law that existed basically as long as mankind existed and the Austrians only developed it in more detail and gave some more sophisticated arguments to defend it. But you will recognize as I proceed that what the Austrians consider to be the theory of law is familiar to all of you. And then I want to contrast it um, to a different view of law that has been developed within the Chicago School uh, in recent decades, uh, which I consider to be some sort of scandalous deviation from uh, what mankind for thousands of years considered to be right uh, and wrong. Um, let me um, start to explain one of the basic uh, reasons why there is anything like law. Um, and I refer to this as the problem of social order. Um, why do we need order at all? Uh, imagine for a second that we live in the Garden of Eden. Um, and um, as you may remember, if you have ever inhabited this place, there is no scarcity of things in the Garden of Eden. There's a superabundance of bananas and apples and beer and wine and whatever, whatever you want. You, you can have it. Um, if there is a superabundance of goods, then it is obvious that conflicts cannot arise. Um, that is, whenever I eat a banana, I don't take anything away from you. There are plenty of bananas left over for you. Whenever I drink a beer, it does not in any way diminish your supply of beer, and it does not diminish my supply of beer in the future either. Um, so first insight is, if there, and to the extent that there is a superabundance of goods, interpersonal conflicts are not possible. Um, and formulate the other way around then, um, only if there exists a scarcity of goods are conflicts possible. And does then the question arise, how can we possibly avoid conflicts? So without scarcity, no conflicts. Without conflicts, no need to find any type of rules that make it possible that conflict can be avoided. In the Garden of Eden, however, some conflicts are still possible uh, because not everything exists in superabundance. What does not exist in superabundance are, for instance, our own physical bodies. Uh, we have only one of them. Um, and because we have only one physical body, you have yours and I have mine, it is possible that even in the Garden of Eden, with the superabundance of bananas and beers and all the rest of it, conflicts can arise if I want to do something to you, for instance, or you want to do something to me, uh, and we do not agree what I should do to you or you should do to me. Um, <laughs> in that case, there is a conflict, and then... The problem arises, what, what, what do we do in this situation? Now we need some sort of rules how we handle conflicts. Um, and the second possible conflict is intimately related to the fact that bodies are scarce, or on physical bodies, we have only one of it, um, is the standing room where we are located in the Garden of Eden is of also only scarce, at least as long as we stand. Uh, even if we float around, uh, it would still be the case that we can get into conflicts with each other if I want to occupy exactly the same place that is already occupied by you or you want to occupy the place that is already occupied by me. Then again, we have a conflict at hand and the question arises, what do we do with these types of conflicts? Now, I suggest that in the Garden of Eden, it would be rather easy how we can possibly resolve these possible conflicts. I will get later on into a defense of these rules, but I simply present something as plausible. 
what rules would we likely accept in the Garden of Eden as rules that allow us to avoid any type of conflict. The one rule would be, uh, I'm the exclusive owner of my body. That is, I can do with this scarce resource whatever I want. And you are the exclusive owner of your body. If I want to do something to your body, then I need your permission. And if you want to do something to my body, then you need my permission. That's rule number one. Everyone owns his own body, so to speak. As I said, I will come to a defense of these rules a little bit later on, but I trust that this is intuitively plausible. What would be the alternatives should be immediately obvious that there is some problem with the alternatives. As I said, I come back to this. And the second rule would be, in the Garden of Eden, you can walk around and move wherever you want, unless that place is already occupied by someone else. Uh, if that other person moves away, then you can also go to the place that was previously occupied by somebody else. Um, and if we would follow these types of rules, these two rules, then of obviously all conflicts could be avoided in the Garden of Eden. So now we leave the Garden of Eden and enter the real world. The real world has one distinctive feature as compared to the Garden of Eden. There's all around scarcity. All sorts of things are scarce. And because all sorts of things are scarce, all sorts of conflicts over all sorts of things can break out. The way to solve this problem is the same as in the Garden of Eden. We have to design, so to speak, rules of exclusive control over scarce resources so that it is always clear who can do something with what and who cannot do something with whatever, something else. So this rules of exclusive control or rules assigning exclusive control over scarce resources to various people are called property rules. He is the proper owner of this and he is the proper owner of that. Um, what would the rules be that we would most likely accept um, in the real world that is characterized by all around scarcity. I will first present the rules and you will immediately recognize what I mentioned at the outset. These are rules that we take in our daily lives practically for granted and have always taken, uh, taken for granted. And then I will give some sort of justification for these rules. These rules are the following four. Actually, only two are necessary. The last two, number three and four, follow from rule number one and two. The first one is the same rule that I already emphasized for the Garden of Eden. You would likely accept that in the Garden of Eden also. Self-ownership, meaning nothing else but I am the exclusive owner of my physical body and you are the exclusive owner of your physical body. My body is my property, your body is your property. I can do something to you only with your permission and you can do something to me only with my permission. The second rule refers to how do we acquire property that is the right to exclusively control scarce resources that were previously unowned entirely. And there the answer is, he who uses a resource that was previously not used by anyone at all for the very first time, puts it to use, becomes thereby the owner of this resource. First use, first own. Uh, sometimes also referred to as original appropriation. Uh, because something that was previously unowned becomes for the very first time owned by someone. Or also sometimes referred to as the homesteading principle. I take into possession, homestead something that was previously unowned. As I said, rule number three and number four follow basically from number one and two. Uh, are implied in one and two. I only list them in order to make it clearer what the meaning of these things is. Uh, rule number three is, if I now begin to produce something with my body which I own and things that I originally appropriated, 
then I, of course, also own the product. Production is, of course, always a transformation of something that previously existed from a state of being less valuable to a desired state of being something more valuable. The producer owns the product. Um, and uh, rule number four um, is um, uh, you can also acquire property that is, again, the right to exclusively control scarce resources over which conflicts can possibly arise by acquiring it from someone who has previously owned it and has come to own it by engaging in rule number two or engaging in rule number uh, in rule number three. That is, through a voluntary transfer of property from a previous owner to a later owner, we can also acquire property. Obviously, in, in the present world, rule number four would be of greater importance. Rule number two and so forth is something that played a greater role at the beginning of of mankind when there was lots of things, were lots of things out there that were not owned at all. Um, now I want to come to a justification of these rules. First, on the level of, of intuition. Um, it should be clear that in our daily lives we do follow these rules more or less anyway without ever having thought about justifying them. Um, even animals behave like this. An animal that has uh, hunted down some prey, for instance, tends to defend it uh, against latecomers wanting to have that stuff. Uh, whenever little children fight over toys, who, who is the, the guy who is entitled to play with this doll or car or whatever it is, the, they always appeal to the first use, first own rule. I was there first, I played with this first, and <laughs> as long as I want to play with it, I am entitled to continue playing. Once I drop it, maybe then you can uh, use it uh, yourself also. Um, but as I said, these are just intuitions. They are not unimportant that we have these intuitions. It's always an advantage if intuitions somehow speak in favor of certain rules rather than having something that is counterintuitive. Um, so now let me come to a yeah, the more rigorous defense of these rules, and I have two slightly different approaches to this. Um, I should mention that the approaches that I will present now, uh, one you can find developed in, um, in Murray Rothbard's Ethics, uh, Ethics of Liberty and also For New Liberty, and this, the other approach you can find developed uh, um, in, mo in greatest detail in in my books, uh, the Theory of Socialism and Capitalism and the Economics and Ethics of, of Private Property. So the first approach goes something like this. Um, what, are, uh, what are the alternatives to these rules? And we can think of basically two alternatives and show what is wrong with the alternative leading us, so to speak, indirectly to accept these rules. The first alternative, and I'll only refer to rule num number one and number two, because as I said, rule three and four are implied in the first two. Um, the first alternative to rule number one would be a system of slavery. Um, that is, I own you, but you don't own me. Okay? I own your body, but you don't own my body. I certainly didn't, wouldn't want to have it the other way around. <laughs> um, so one alternative is instead of you own yourself, I own myself, I own you, but you don't own me. Um, what's wrong with this alternative? Um, what's wrong with this alternative is this alternative, alternative does not fulfill the requirement of universalization. In ethics, we typically think that 
uh, a rule that strives to be a rule that is a fair, fair rule, a general principle, must be in principle applicable or acceptable by everyone. It must apply to everyone in the same way. Um, this is also uh, yeah, so implied in, uh, in the golden rule of ethics. Don't do unto others that you don't want done unto you. Um, so this principle of it has to be a universal rule applying to all is obviously not fulfilled by this system of slavery. The slave could never accept this as a fair as a fair rule. We have, in fact, two ethical systems. We have, so to speak, rules applying to superman and rules applying to inferior uh, inferior man. Uh, we would we could also formulate a different. We might have ethical systems that apply to women and ethic, a different ethical system applying to uh, to men. Uh, or one system applying to, uh, to blondies and the other one to dark-haired people. Um, so this sort of system uh, fails because it does not fulfill the universalization criterion. It's out because of this. Then there is only one alternative system, and that is what we call universal communism. That is, I own part of you, <laughs> and you own part of me. Um, whatever, we have 50 people here, I own one fiftieth of you, and you own one fiftieth of me. Yeah. You realize that this, um, this rule is universalizable. The, the same principle applies to all. In this regard, we might consider this to be superior, an alternative that is, in fact, acceptable based on that criterion. Um, but in fact, this system, this alternative, uh, is even more flawed, so to speak, than the first one. Slavery can at least be put into practice. That is, as a matter of fact, it has been put into practice many, many times. It, it is still put into practice at various places on the globe today. A system of universal communism cannot even be put into practice for the following reason. Um, Look, if I wanted to do anything, whatever it is, with my own physical body, but I would not be the exclusive owner of my physical body because you are part owners of my physical body, what would then be necessary for me to do anything? I have to just get your permission to do this. So I just, can I do this? And then I have to ask every one of you, can I do this? But that is not even... The end of the story. Can you even say, yes, you can do this, or no, you cannot do this? And the answer is, no, you can't do that either, because after all, what do you need in order to say it? Yeah, you need so, your vocal cords, you need some sort of brain waves just waving around there. Uh, but you don't own all of this. You own only a fiftieth of your vocal cords. So you cannot even say a peeps without having somebody else agree to it, and nobody can agree to it because, after all, they don't own exclusively these vocal cords either that allows them to say peep. Um, so what would be the consequence if we would adopt universal communism? Yes, mankind would instantly die out. That is just something that cannot be put into practice at all. So then we are back at square one. The two alternatives that we can think of have to be dropped for various reasons, and we are back with this. This fulfills the universalization criterion. The same rule applies to everyone. You own yours, I own mine. Um, and secondly, if we would follow these rules, mankind can survive. Obviously, no ethic, no system of law that forces mankind to instantly die out can be considered to be a human system of law or a human system of ethics. These rules, however, can do this. The same is also true for first use, uh, first own. Um, if I am not, if I'm, uh, uh, the, the alternatives would be, um, 
I own whatever I appropriate first, but you don't own whatever you appropriate first. Just like in the slavery case. We have again two sets of Essex, one for Superman and one for whatever the alternative to Superman is. Um, and that is out because of this. If we have universal communism applied to rule number, rule number two, again, nobody would be permitted to appropriate anything first at all. Uh, because for every move, we would have to have the permission of somebody else who comes, uh, who comes later. Um, I'll have to say a little bit about economic reasons, speaking for these rules a little bit later on too. At the current moment, I want to leave economic reasons out. Uh, all you need to see is the alternatives to these rules either do not allow that the rules are universal, applying to all equally, or they make life absolutely impossible, lead to mankind dying out. Only these principles allow are universal and universalizable, plus allow mankind to, yeah, to survive, to live. Um, now I want to come to the second way of defending these principles, another a somewhat different approach. Um, first point in this different approach is to make you aware of the fact that it is not only scarcity alone that is necessary in order for ethical or law problems to arise, but there's a second requirement. I can have conflicts, for instance, with a mosquito and an elephant. Um, a mosquito can sit on my arm and uh, bite me. Um, there is a conflict uh, as regards the use of scarce resources. My arm is a scarce resource, the mosquito bites me. Uh, or the elephant comes trampling into my store. Uh, there's, a, there's a conflict over the use of scarce resources. Um, do we have an ethical problem at hand? Do we have a problem at hand that requires, so to speak, a legal solution? And the answer is uh, no. Uh, and why not? Because I simply cannot argue with these guys. <laughs> I cannot just, I cannot tell the mosquito, don't, don't you recognize that this, uh, I had <laughs> first control of this arm before, how dare you to just sting me here, or talk to the elephant and say, didn't you see the sign at the door that says it is closed? Um, so the entities, both entities that have a conflict with each other must be capable of arguing with each other, of talking to each other, Otherwise, we have only technical problems at hand. The mosquito problem is easily handled. I just smash it. There's a technical, there's a tec there exists a technical solution to this problem. The elephant problem is a little bit more difficult to handle, but it's also a technical problem. I just have to learn how to either shoot it or tame it or fence it in or whatever it is, and then the problem goes away. So what we recognize here is, Conf scarcity of goods alone are not sufficient in order to have ethical problems. It is necessary that the conflicting partners or the conflicting parties are both entities that have rationality and rationality is exhibited, is demonstrated by the ability to engage in arguments, to engage in argumentation, in discussions. Um, you also realize immediately that you cannot possibly deny that that is the case. Like, because whenever you would say, no, this is not true what you are just saying, you are precisely doing what I'm saying you have to do. Whenever we talk about something that is um, uh, true or not true, whenever if a debate is a justified, unjustified, all of this takes place in the course of an argumentation. You cannot deny that that is so, without contradicting yourself. Uh, you can also not deny that we can argue, uh, because your denial would have to be an argument itself. Because of this, we, this has also been referred to as the a priori of argumentation. 
This is, so to speak, the necessary starting point from which every debate about is there ethics, uh, are humans rational, is there no is ethics a rational discipline or not, anything, all questions such as this, is there truth or is there no truth at all, any of these questions must necessarily require necessarily that we engage in some sort of argument. This is undeniably true. Um, now, when we argue, however, arguing is not just free-floating propositions. It's not just free-floating sounds. Uh, we have two people, a proponent of an argument and opponent. Um, and the proponent and the opponent must have control over some physical things in order to do the arguing. Um, that is, they must control their brain, they must control their vocal cords, they must, it doesn't really matter all the things that they have to control, but we can say with absolute certainty, they must control something directly, some physical things directly, otherwise they cannot engage in any type of argument. And now, coming to the defense of self-ownership, no one arguing with anyone else can possibly or make this argument first. What you cannot possibly deny in any argument are things that are presupposed by any argument. Look, you cannot ask for a reason for something that is required in order to engage in reasoning in the first place. Now to the defense. You cannot obviously in an argument say uh, and expect an, uh, an answer, a response from another arguer, uh, I'm not entitled to exclusive control over my vocal cords, over my brain, and so forth, without contradicting myself. Obviously, I'm doing it, and must think that I'm entitled to it, otherwise I would have to shut up. I would have to shut up forever, and if I shut up forever, then I do not deserve any argument. Then I do not deserve an answer to any of my problems. Then I'm just a material object that somebody can hit over the head. <laughs> and of course, my opponent in the argument, that the person that I address and say, don't you think this is right, or do you think this is false, I must also think that he is entitled to have exclusive control over certain scarce resources. Otherwise, th there would be absolutely no point in ever addressing this person in this way. So it is argumentatively impossible to dispute the principle of self-ownership. Everybody who would in an argument dispute the principle of self-ownership would be involved in what is called a performative contradiction. That is, the statement that he makes, you are not entitled to open your mouth, you are not entitled to give me an argument, is contradicted by the fact of engaging in an argument. So this is a second, a, a second approach to defending these, um, these principles. Now, a few um, quick uh, additions to these principles to avoid some I'm late um, to, to, to avoid sometimes some misunderstandings about the meaning of these principles. The first thing is property always refers to exclusive control over physical resources. We have property rights only in the physical integrity of what we consider our property, but not in the value of things. Um, I will not defend this in a, in a detailed way, uh, but try to make it simply plausible. If we would have a value, if you would have property in the value of our bodies, for instance, then the mere existence, the mere appearance of somebody else might already be an, an, uh, a violation of property rights. If I'm in the marriage market or in the labor market and I'm after a job or after a girl, and then you appear on the scene, you might drop the value that I have in the labor market or in the marriage market. This would be an aggression. On the other hand, of course, this is also to applies just the same way to you. Um, so. 
we have property rights in the physical integrity of our property, of our physical body, and in the physical integrity of our houses and whatever it is, but not in the value of our houses. Um, second thing, in order to decide who is right and wrong in property disputes, it is very often important to take into consideration that property is acquired in the course of time. Um, let's say I acquire a piece of uh, piece of land, then build something on the land and uh, soil neighboring territory. But nobody lives on this neighboring territory. It's empty. Then, even though I have physically changed the features of the outside world through my activity, I have not committed an aggression in any way because nobody lives next to me. Um, on the other hand, let's say um, you have acquired a piece of property, then I come later and become your neighbor and begin to produce something on my piece of land and now I soil your property adjacent to my piece of property. Um, in that case, I have committed an aggression against you uh, because I have change the physical integrity of your property in so far as I came later and you were there first. You had initially clean property, I dirtied your property. If it was the other way around, this I was there first, I dirtied unowned land around me and then you came and says, yeah, but this property is dirty. Uh, the answer is, yeah, but you acquired dirty property. It was dirty from the very outset. I have not committed any aggression against you. Quite to the contrary, you acquired property knowing that the property has these types of qualities. And as I said, just very, br very briefly to indicate sometimes, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, um, what, um, how property acqu is acquired in the course of time, and we have to look at who acquired what first and who acquired what later on in order to determine who is right and wrong in property disputes. Um, third point, uh, to avoid, so to speak, misunderstandings in these rules, there is no such thing as intellectual property rights. My friend Stephen Kinsella will give a speech, I think, tomorrow um, on, on this subject in, uh, in details. We do not own ideas. Ideas, once they have been sought, are no longer scarce objects. Uh, only physical entities can be scarce and uh, conflicts can arise over them. If there would be such a thing as intellectual property rights, let me only indicate what sort of ab absurd consequences this would have. Um, so let's say the first person who ever thought of the word and or of the word or uh, <laughs> would now have the right to eternally uh, own, get royalties from anybody afterwards using the word and, or, or. Um, the, the, the heirs of Aristotle, um, handling some whatever, some bar in Greece right now, uh, would eternally, eternally get from everyone who ever thinks A cannot be non A and, or uh, nothing can be A and non A at the same time, uh, w would have to earn royalties. Uh, as I said, a detailed speech on this subject will be given by Stefan Kinsella. The Randians, for instance, believe there exists something like this, like intellectual, uh, intellectual property rights. I think the reason why they frequently think is they have an inflated idea about their own originality. Uh, <laughs> they, they, do not, they, they do not recognize that most of the stuff that they have sought has been sought by thousands, thousands of people thousands of years ago. Um, they would be very humble if they would realize to whom they own all, all, all of their, um, all of their ideas. Um, now, brief, a brief explanation about the economic advantage of these rules. Slavery is an unproductive system. Um, there are people who do not own themselves and do not own what they produce with their own physical body have a relatively low incentive to be productive individuals. Uh, if the first one 
to make use of something that was previously owned would not be recognized as the owner. Then the incentive to be the first one is rather low. Imagine I know that there is something in Russia, there's some valuable gold in, in the ground, and I schlep out there thinking that I might be the owner. If I would know from the outset that I will not be recognized, that I will have to share it with all sorts of additional people, the likelihood that I will do this activity will be significantly lower than it otherwise would be. Uh, in addition, if the first one would not be recognized as, as the owner, um, then the second one would become the first one. The second one, not wanting to be the first one because he is not recognized as the exclusive owner, would also not do it. But then the third one would become um, the the uh, the owner, and he he would be again the first one and would not be recognized. So it should be perfectly clear that if we do not recognize this rule, the amount of production that takes place will be significantly diminished. The same thing with rule number four, the producer owns the product. What are the alternatives? The producer does not own the product? Um, who has then an incentive to be productive? Or well, the producer, and this is of course what we have in, in most, uh, most states nowadays, the producer owns, um, yeah, in the United States he owns 50% uh, of the product and 50 he doesn't own. Or if you're in European countries, the producer owns 30% of what he produces and 70% is owned by something, uh, owned by someone else. Um, just, just do it a little bit more extreme, then you have complete socialism. I own 1% of what I produced and 99% you suckers will get. <laughs> um, so who, who would work under these type of, of circumstances as diligently as he would if he were the exclusive owner. And of course, it should be perfectly clear that if rule number four is not upheld, uh, the incentive for people to be productive is virtually, uh, virtually disappears. N nobody has any incentive to be productive because everybody can just um, grab whatever they want from, um, from someone else. Um, so, if we follow these rules, we can also see that by and large, uh, prosperity will be maximized. So now I come to um, the alternative view of property. As I said, if you want to read more detailed accounts of this, read the, the two Rothbard books I mentioned, read the two books of myself that, that, that I mentioned, you'll find more sophisticated uh, arguments in favor of these things and uh, many things that I couldn't get into, uh, where I could not cover all details, you, f you find that there. Um, now to the Chicago School. Um, and I refer here in particular to two individuals, Ronald Coase, uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics, and uh, Richard Posner, a famous uh, lawyer. Coase has written very little in his life, but actually quite good stuff, uh, except this. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Posner has an enormous body of uh, uh, writing. Um, uh, I'll begin with an example that plays a great role in, in Coe's writing and has not been taken up by many uh, legal theorists. Um, that is the following example. You have, you have a farmer and you have a railroad. Um, the railroad uh, runs through a field, uh, sparks are emitted and uh, uh, the crop is sometimes burned down because of the sparks that are emitted by, by the railroad. Now, what is the traditional, and the question is now, uh, can the f farmer complain about the railroad, the railroad about the farmer, who is right and who is wrong in the conflicts that result now between the farmer on the one hand and the railroad operator on the other hand? Um, now, how would Austrians solve this, not just Austrians, how has this question been handled traditionally? And the answer is quite simple. It depends on who was there first. If there was a farmer there first, and he grew his crop, 
and uh, no damage occurred to the crop. And then the railroad built the railroad, and now sparks were emitted, and the crop burns down. Then, of course, it is decided the railroad is responsible for the damage. They have to compensate the farmer, or the farmer can prohibit the railroad from doing what it is currently doing. On the other hand, if the railroad had operated first, and sparks were emitted from the railroad and falling on the ground, and nobody lived there, there was no problem. Now the farmer come, the farmers came and uh, started growing crop there, and the crop was burned down, then the decision would be the other way around. Then you would say the farmers knew full well that the railroad was operating there, that uh, sparks were emitted from the railroads. Um, and in this case, the decision would be the railroad can, of course, continue to do what they want to do. If the farmer wants to stop them, so to speak, the, the farmer has to pay for protection against this type of potential damage that occurs. So that is the simple standard tradition um, in, in jurisprudence. All judges, by and large, decided these cases like this in practically every country. Um, so depending on who was there first, either the railroad can continue doing what they did, and it's the farmer's business, so to speak, to see to it that nothing happens to his crop, or if the farmer was there, then, of course, he can take an injunction against the railroad, uh, ask, seek for compensation, or simply uh, force them to stop, uh, stop operating in the way they do. This is not the way that Chicago legal theorists want that case handled. Um, i read you what Coase says about this uh, situation. He does not look at the time dimension at all. He argues the following way. Um, so Coase thinks it is wrong to think of the farmer and the railroad as either right or wrong, as liable or as an aggressor and a victim. Again, recall, depending on the time dimension, we determine who is right and who is wrong, who is the aggressor and who is the victim. Coase instead thinks the following. The question is commonly thought of as one in which A inflicts harm on B, and what has to be decided is how should we restrain A. But this is wrong. We are dealing with a problem of a reciprocal nature. To avoid the harm to B would be to inflict harm on A. The real question that has to be decided is, should A be allowed to harm B, or should B be allowed to harm A? The problem is to avoid the more serious harm. So he thinks, for instance, by outlawing the railroad from emitting sparks, we harm the railroad. Um, or by um, uh, by allowing, um, oh, yeah, no, should be clear. Um, in either case, by prohibiting one party to do something, we inflict harm on them. Um, let me just give an example, a very extreme example. I think Walter Block used it sometimes um, to to show how absurd this position is. Um, and I'm using uh, uh, I'm, I'm using Kosa's words, but applying them to a different case than the farmer and uh, the railroad operator in order to make the clear the case perfectly clear. Um, take the case of rape. So A rapes B. Okay. Um, according to to Kos, um, we cannot say that A, that the rapist is the aggressor and the person who is being raped is the victim because this is a problem of reciprocal nature. Um, we are dealing with a problem of reciprocal nature. In preventing A from raping B, harm is inflicted on A because we say, Look, you are not allowed to rape. <laughs> right? 
so this is this is a serious harm that is inflicted on A. He cannot uh, he can no longer freely rape. Um, the real question is: Should A be allowed to rape B, um, or should B be allowed to prohibit A from raping him or her? <laughs> the problem is to avoid the more serious harm. Now, how do we determine now what? Was the harm more serious or wasn't it more serious? Now imagine something like this. So let's say the person being raped is a professional prostitute. Uh, they are in the business of doing this sort of stuff all the time anyway. Uh, and the other one, and the, and the rapist has been incarcerated for 20 years uh, and was prevented from having any any fun in this period of time. Now he, now he comes, now he comes out, um, and, and rapes, rapes the woman. Um, might it not be possible to say that if we would p- prevent the rapist from doing his business, that we are doing far more serious psychological harm to him than by allowing him to go on and rape uh, rape the prostitute, after all, what's a big deal for her to be raped? <laughs> she does this sort of stuff anyway. So if we weigh the, the psychic harm and benefit of the people, we might actually come to the conclusion um, that is perfectly all right what the guy does. And now I want to show you that this is indeed what the Chicago School implies. Not They do not apply it to the rape case, but I will give you cases where this is exactly how they decide these sorts of things. Um, here. Posner. Yes, now, in these types of conflicts, um, how do we decide who is right and who is wrong? And its fundamental definition is um, just is what maximizes wealth. And wealth is measured in terms of mon- monetary wealth. So just is what maximizes monetary wealth. And unjust is what reduces monetary wealth. To give you an example, so he's f- taking from Posner. Suppose a polluting factory lowers residential property values in an area by two million dollars. Again, keep in mind here, the time dimension is never taken into consideration here. So, um, polluting factory lowers residential property values in an area by, area by two million, but then it would cost the factory three million to relocate to a different place. On this basis, the factory prevails. The factory can simply continue polluting because it would be more expensive to relocate uh, than the damage that they do. And recall, why do they come to this conclusion? Because what maximizes wealth is just and what does not maximize wealth is unjust. Now, reverse the numbers. Um, a judgment that forces the factory um, that, so now reverse the numbers that, uh, let's say, uh, the property damage is 3 million and the cost of relocation is 2 million. Uh, then the factory would have to relocate because that would uh, maximize uh, monetary, monetary wealth. Um, so we decide, so to speak, who is right and who is wrong by looking which decision would lead to higher monetary values of property and which one would lead to lower. Again, let me just use some some drastic examples. Um, If I determine, for instance, uh, that you are a bum um, and that you are wasting your money, um, that all of the money that you have in your wallet will be just... uh, wasted on buying booze. Whereas I would use this money more wisely and would invest it and that would turn into a larger sum in a short period of time. 
then Chicago economists would argue, you are not the legitimate owner of your money in your wallet. I should be made the legitimate owner of the money in your wallet because I make better use of it. You can expropriate owners who do not make good use of their property and hand it over, actually decisions like this are being made in American courts, and hand it over to somebody who is making better use of the property. Expropriations such as this have been done in Vegas, for instance. People said did not keep their property up in a pr proper shape, and there could be a mall built on the same place. You take it away from one who does not make good use of it, and give it to somebody, give it to somebody else. Now you realize, if property rights, the assignment of property rights is made like this, then property rights become very insecure. Um, because the conditions can, of course, change in the course of time. You say, I might turn into a bum, and you might sober up. Then I would have to give up my resources again to you, um, and so forth. That is, people are not constant in the way that they function and operate. Depending on changing circumstances, you might become the owner, or I might become the owner, you might become expropriated, or I might become expropriated. Again, some, some nice examples from Posner. Um, imagine Henry Ford, the founder of Henry Ford factory, would have decided to become, what he says, a Trappist monk. Trappist monks are just people who just withdraw from the world and don't say anything. <laughs> what, what would Henry Ford then have done? He would have reduced wealth, because being alone, enjoying solitude, is something that reduces wealth as compared with being the Henry Ford that we know of, that is the one who built cars. Um, so what Henry Ford would do if he became a Trappist monk would be an utter injustice. Um, and we would have to do something about this. What could we do? We could force Henry Ford not to become a Trappist monk, but to be the Henry Ford that we know, the one who built, uh, who builds cars. So he says here, for instance, if there is a taste for pure solitude, that is, for seclusion unrelated to social interaction, it is a selfish emotion. Solitary activity benefits only the actor. Work, on the other hand, confers benefits on others. There is thus a sense in which the person who works is unselfish, while the individual who retires from the world reduces his contribution to the wealth of other people in society. And because of this, of course, he acts in an unjust way, and we have to punish him for this. Uh, all people who are close to retirement age, like myself, should keep that in mind, that there might be a, a claim against them, that as soon as they stop working, they have to be forced to continue working until they keel over. Until they keel over. <laughs> Um, and then to just top it all off, to, to, to give you a, f a feeling of, yeah, of uh, the logical stringency of Chicago school reasoning, this quote, this is on rights in general by Posner. He says, absolute rights play an important role in the e economic theory of the law. Absolute rights meaning there can be no violation of that right. But when transaction costs are prohibitive, and he doesn't say when they are, the recognition of absolute rights is inefficient. Property rights, this is now, I mean you have to read it twice in order to just get the point. Property rights, although absolute, are contingent on transaction cost and subservient or instrumental to the goal of wealth maximization. So property rights are ab property rights are absolute except when they are not. <laughs> <laughs> so with this, um, I'll end my uh, end my remarks. As I said, what the Austrian view of property rights is. 
This is nothing special. This is what, what every normal person on the street by and large takes for granted. And what Chicago economists do is what most normal people consider to be perverse. I see you next time. Okay, well. <laughs>